Hey everybody, this is Alex Merced and welcome to a new episode of Web Dev 101. And in this topic, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the difference between multi-threading, uh, concurrency, and parallelism. Okay, so let's talk about it. <clears throat> so the bottom line is this, the way a computer works is you have your processor. Your processor is the thing that actually like runs the instructions that are that your computer is sending it. Now, basically, a processor is made up of one or more cores. So think of each core as sort of one brain, and that one brain can take in one instruction at a time. But that one brain that that's doing one instruction at a time might be getting instructions from many different programs that are running at the same time. And all each each process is running on a separate thread. So then what happens is essentially that core is, is, is basically going, hey, let me go do one thing from this thread, let me go do something from this thread. And it keeps bouncing between the different threads and executing those instructions. Okay, so basically, if I were to write my entire program, so if I'm writing JavaScript, JavaScript is by default a single threaded programming language. So you're writing that script that you wrote is one single process running on one single thread. So <clears throat> that processor is juggling the instructions that are being run one at a time in your process between all the other processes it's running on the same processor. Got it. So one way to speed up your program is something called multi-threading, where you can basically split up the work you're trying to do across multiple threads. Okay, because that way, basically, while one thread is doing one thing, another thread could be doing another thing, you're st it's still the same processor, so you're not necessarily <clears throat> you're not necessarily getting things done faster per se. Usually, where this multi-threading can really be helpful is when you're doing something on a when you're doing something in process that would block. So, for example, like making an API call, okay, or making a database call. So you're communic communicating with some sort of third-party system external, and you really have no idea when that system is going to get back to you. So if I just made my whole code in one single thread and that thread is waiting for that response, then nothing else is being executed on that thread in the meantime. So basically, <clears throat> that processor is going to back to all the other threads and taking care of those in the meantime. So in that case, I might notice like a pause while it waits for the database to get back to it, or a pause while it waits for the API call to respond. So in this case, with multi-threading, okay, um, and there's different ways to handle this, um, because there's also the way promises work, which is not multi-threading, it's essentially just basically reallocating what happens when, okay, referred to as the event loop. Okay, so essentially that deals with this naturally in JavaScript. So in JavaScript, you you, you can avoid, before you even get into multi-threading, you have the event loop that's built into JavaScript that allows you to defer actions. So in that case, that's why you would wrap sort of like database things and API calls generally in a promise, because that'll delay the evaluation of it so that we can do other things in the meantime. So just by being able to kind of dynamically set the order at which things get evaluated, you're able to, to be, take more advantage of processing in a single thread. Okay, so the event loop allows us to maximize the use of a single thread. Now, again, multi-thread processing would be basically saying, hey, you know what? Maybe I have an API. My API receives, you know, like a file that needs a bunch of images and need to be turned into a video. But instead of doing that in your main application, what you might do is pass those photos to a separate script. So that's going to run on a separate thread. Okay. <clears throat> and basically that'll create the video and then send the video back to the other thread when it's done. But again, still running to the same processor. So that process is running simultaneously while this other, well, you know, basically let's say while your server application is handling other requests. Um, now the thing is that generally multiple threads they are, they don't share variables. They generally have their own memory. There are ways to share memory between them, and this is oftentimes you see this in the terms of like message passing in a lot of different languages. And this gets pretty tricky because bottom line is like I don't know like these are two separate things that are happening at the same time, and I don't know when one's going to finish. So basically, there's it gets tri the more you start doing this sort of like concurrent tasks the more complicated this gets. And again, um, so all of this is under the umbrella of concurrency. How can you do multiple things at the same time? 
but there's multi-threaded concurrency. Okay, so we have that. Okay. <clears throat> then there's multi-processor concurrency. So this is where you start saying, hey, different tasks are being not done on just different threads on the same processor, but different but on separate threads on separate processors. So in that case, you are significantly speeding things up because basically two things literally can be done at the same time because they're on separate processors that are processing that separately. Okay, so this is where you start hearing about like multi, you know, um, multi-processor or multi-core concurrency. So that's like the next level up. Okay, and so basically, you know, for example, imagine that you were to write a server that would be able to take advantage of this sort of multi-processor con concurrency or multi-core concurrency, essentially it would receive requests and might basically allocate the processing of those requests to subscripts that are running on different processors. So basically each of its routes, each of its processes might be set up as a separate sort of script that it then runs to satisfy that request and sends it back and is able to separate those jobs to different processors. And I think this kind of thing is what Elixir was built for, like um, actually more specifically the Erlang virtual machine. So the Erlang virtual machine, virtual machines are generally oftentimes um, these applications. So it's like the Java virtual machine, the, the Erlang virtual machine, the LLVM, which I forget what the LL stands for. Um, but generally what they do is that they allow you to write, they generally interpret a intermediate format. So in this case in Java, it's, uh, Java bytecode, uh, Erlang, I imagine it would be called, I mean, I imagine it's called Erlang bytecode. I, I, I don't know what it's called. Or in um, in the C, in the .NET uh, environment, you know, there's an intermediate format that's essentially the bytecode. Um, but essentially what the idea is that you can program in a programming language and instead of compiling that programming language directly to binary into machine language, you compile it to this intermediate format and the beauty of it is you can any any computer that has that virtual machine installed can run that software this is why like java claimed write once run anywhere because i can write that java code and long as that computer has the java virtual machine installed it should be able to run the program regardless of whether it's mac windows linux etc <clears throat> okay so erlang is a a virtual machine like that but if i understand correctly one of the, th the reasons it was built was to kind of handle multi-core concurrency and make that a lot easier. So languages like Erlang and Elixir have a lot of sort of syntax built around that to make that more intuitive, okay, um, to handle those kind of specific things. Um, but I think most languages have a way of handling that. Um, JavaScript gets a little bit more tricky, but I think in the new bun runtime for JavaScript, there is some new technically still multi-threading, but some new syntax that makes sort of running multiple processes as part of one big thing a lot easier, uh, which is really neat because it has like its own built-in shell, which I'm, I, it's not the topic of this video, so I'm not going to get too deep into it, but it, it's pretty cool. Okay, so again, how can I better make my, pro how can I make my program faster when there's a lot of things that happen? Again, there's the event loop, where I can just kind of shuffle when things happen. So things that I know that'll take some time, I can then shuffle them to be evaluated later. That's what we do with the event loop with promises. There's multi-threaded concurrency where I just have multiple threads on the same processor. And then there's multi-core concurrency um, where basically I'm sending work to diff two different cores. Then there's a the whole idea of parallelism, okay, which is similar. I mean, the difference here is more like like a server might be sending, handling different requests across different cores, but each what each of those things are doing are just kind of separate jobs. Like I'm getting separate requests and I'm handling those different requests at different cores. Now in parallelism is more like if I'm doing one thing across multiple cores, okay? Across, and sometimes, oftentimes across multiple machines, okay? This is a big thing in the big data space because when you're processing petabytes of data, like if you're in like a Netflix or an Apple, where you're handling vast, huge amounts of data, there isn't gonna be a single computer that can really process that data efficiently. There just isn't a processor powerful enough with enough cores that by itself is gonna process that data. So oftentimes systems uh, created for handling these kind of data, like the company that I work for, Dremio, <clears throat> they create these systems that allow you to create clusters of computer, clusters of computers, okay? And essentially what it does 
is that there's generally a main computer. So, so in the Dremio world, that's referred to as the coordinator node. And then it has different worker nodes. And the idea is that the coordinator node would receive the instructions and saying, hey, I want to process the data this way. And then basically it'll distribute that data across all the workers with instructions on what needs to be done. And each worker across its multiple cores will split do their chunk of that job. Okay. So in that case, I might have, let's say, a petabyte of data. Okay. And then I might have a cluster of, you know, a, a cluster of, let's say, 10 worker nodes. And essentially, you know, each of those worker nodes might be handling like 100 terabytes of that data. And I might want a bigger cluster for a petabyte of data. I might, you know, want like a hundred worker nodes. So that way each one's processing like a terabyte of data. <clears throat> or actually 10 terabytes of data. Um, you know, but again, that means you spend more money on having all those extra machines, whether real or virtual. So concurrency, that, that level of concurrency gets really expensive. Like, so now we're talking about multiple computers coordinating the job between each other. This is where like, this is referred, referred to as massively parallel processing. Because again, now you, you're taking advantage of every level of parallelism here. You're taking that same job, putting up across multiple computers with multiple cores, breaking up that job across multiple threads uh, to try to get the fastest processing and handling of that job ever. And this is so, oftentimes some of the most complex programming there is because you're trying to coordinate all of this. And you have when you have when you have sort of concurrent processes, you run into this issue that's referred to as race conditions. So what happens if I have two things that are happening at the same time and basically I'm expecting, basically at the end of process A, it's going to do something that assumes that pro process B has already finished. But what happens if I get to that point and process B has not finished? That might cause an error. So it's like handling all these possibilities of like, okay, how do I make sure that when I get to certain points that my code is kind of waiting for everything it depends on to be done. So orchestrating all these processes to, to, to break. And this is where like different techniques, like things like, like uh, directed acyclic graphs, which are a data structure that allows you to kind of express like the dependency of things. So like imagine like uh, a bunch of circles and lines. So you have like job, like thing A. And then when A is done, there's B and C. Okay, so you have two, a line from A to B and a line from A to C. Okay, and then when C and B are done, there's a D that depends on both of those being done. So that you have a line from C to, I mean, from B to D and a line from C to D. Okay, and the idea is that D isn't going to happen until B and C are done because there's those are the two dependencies. So there's different sort of data structures you can use to help sort of orchestrate these things, which is why, again, on a system like Dremio, you have a coordinator node that's going to like coordinate these things. So as each as each sort of node finishes their work, they're going to notify the coordinator and the coordinator will kind of coordinate what the next step is. Um, but it gets, it, you know, at this level, it gets pretty complicated. Now, if you're in web development, um, oftentimes, like, really the thing you should focus on is really getting a firm handle of the JavaScript event loop, which is technically single-threaded, okay? The only thing that's happening there is on a single thread, you're just delaying certain things and creating certain, you know, not... Uh, not synchronous or not one after the other order of things that are going to be done. So when I wrap something in a promise, I'm basically saying, okay, come back and check if this promise has resolved later. And you can have your other code running, and then you can queue which code should run when that process is done through you know the dot then method on promises. Um, and you know again, every language is going to have their different ways of handling concurrency, but that conceptually is what it is. And sort of the challenges of it, because again, you have these sort of separately running things that have their own separate variables, their own separate memory, and you're trying to kind of coordinate them all in a way that achieves a singular thing, and that definitely requires uh, a lot of thinking. Uh, so generally, you want to master being able to do things on a single thread first and get really comfortable just sort of breaking down tasks on a single thread first before you really start exploring sort of multi-threading and multi-core and multi-node uh, uh, type systems. Uh, because there's a lot that goes into them. But with that, my name is Alex Merced. You've been listening to Web Development 101. Have a great day. Enjoy. I'll see you all later.